Captain Charlie Plum, welcome to the show. Welcome to Become Your Own Superhero. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to becoming my own superhero. Well, it sounds like to me, Captain, that you've already become your own superhero a few times over in your extraordinary life. And we are so privileged to have you as a guest of the show today. And uh, it ties in so beautifully with the name, I think. And uh, I think a great place to start might be sharing with my audience or our audience, who is Captain Charlie Plum? Well, first of all, I'm a, a father of four and grandfather of four and uh, and a husband, of course. So um, I have a great life and I, I, I suppose I could be defined in a lot of different ways. I have kind of an interesting history. Um, I was a Navy pilot, Navy fighter pilot for quite a few years. I graduated from the Naval Academy and um, went on to fly jets for the Navy. Uh, flew 74 successful combat missions in Vietnam, and on the 75th one, with just five days from returning home, I, my co-pilot and I were hit by a surface-to-air missile, exploded to some 12,000 pounds of jet fuel on that airplane, and sent that bird topsy-turvy end over end down towards the rice paddy below. Sorry about right. that. It's I, all right, Captain. We're not broadcasting live. And even we if got, we were, it wouldn't matter. <laughs> we might even uh, keep this in for a full effect. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. <laughs> the truth will set us free, right? Absolutely. It shows you how pop popular I am. I'm getting <laughs> phone calls. <laughs> so there we were, upside down, at a, going about 500 miles an hour, screaming fireball, you know, headed for the rice paddy. And my co pilot was getting a little concerned. <clears throat> yeah, he, <laughs> he, he had. He hadn't seen aerobatics like that for a while. And uh, so <laughs> he's talking to me in a voice about two octaves higher than normal. He's like, get out. <laughs> so I said, let's eject. Oh, the problem was we were upside down. An ejection seat is like a rocket under your chair. And you, you set this thing off with a face curtain. You pull a face curtain down, which protects your face from the oncoming wind. <clears throat> and um, But when you do that, you know, all these things happen within a second. You know, the canopy blows off and and you're detached from all of the systems of the airplane, oxygen and pressurization and communication and all this stuff. But anyway, it all happens just like that. And you're blown out the top of the airplane and we were upside down. <laughs> so in my razor sharp mind, I, the, I had a degree in, in engineering. I figured that to eject from that altitude upside down is going to plant us about six and a half feet below the level of the rice paddy. <laughs> so <laughs> had, had, to, had to turn the airplane upright. I grabbed the stick, which normally controls, you know, the, uh, the, the, the attitude of the airplane, and it was frozen. I'd, lo I'd lost all my hydraulic pressure. The only the only control I had left was a, a rudder. The, the, the rudder on an F4 Phantom is hydraulic, but it's manually, it's a, it's a boosted, hydraulic boosted manual rudder. And so if you hit that thing hard enough, and say a prayer loud enough, <laughs> the airplane shuddered, rolled back upright where I ejected, my co-pilot ejected, our parachutes opened, and we came floating down over enemy territory. So, um, that began a saga of 2,103 days in prison camps uh, in North Vietnam. So I had uh, six birthdays, six Christmases, six uh, Groundhog Days. <laughs> so it was a, a pretty good chunk of my life. But that I was 24 when I was shot down, 30 when I came home. So. Basically, that was one fifth of my total life at that time. Um, but like all things in life, you know, I I learned a great deal from that experience, and uh, and, and and we can talk about lessons learned in time of challenge because I think that's that's really the basics of of my message, you know, to my audiences in my writings. It's just um, the fact that adversity is a horrible thing to waste. And I found that you can waste adversity in a prison camp by 
blaming everybody you can think of, you know, blaming the president for starting the war, blame the mechanic who put your airplane together. Um, and, and in the blame, the blame the guards for the torture. And in the blame, you're actually giving away uh, control of your life. You're, 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 you're passing along uh, to somebody else uh, decisions for yourself. So, so uh, if adversity is a horrible thing to waste, then you waste it by feeling sorry for yourself, going into this woe is me mode of life, a little pity party for Charlie Plum. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and by doing that, you, you deny any kind of advantage, any kind of lesson learned, any kind of uh, advancement in, in, in your, in your self-determination that you would have, um, in a situation like that. So the war ended, I came home, found that my, my wife, my, at the time, my high school sweetheart, whom I had married under the arch of swords outside the chapel, um, had filed for divorce. She hung on for five years and just three months before I came home, she um, fell in love and was actually engaged to another guy when I, when I was released. <clears throat> so the saga then continued with more challenges in my life. But um, like most things we go through, as you have been through uh, yourself and most of your audience has, uh, have, have been through these little, little bumps in the road, um, you know, you, you pick up the pieces and um, press on with your life. So, uh, so today, obviously, many years later, I have been on this speaking circuit for 47 years, spoken over 5,000 times um, in um, 23 foreign countries in every state in the United States, um, telling my, my message. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's, it's a great, wonderful life that I lead. I'm the luckiest guy around because I have a doorknob on the inside of my door. And there's somebody to be said for that. <laughs> Captain, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated to know if you've ever had an opportunity to speak in front of any of your former captors. I have actually. Um, I. I was invited back to Vietnam. Um, well, it started probably 10 years ago and I had no real interest. The, the head of the, of the history department, University of Hanoi, uh, North Vietnam, was, uh, was trying to do a documentary and he wanted me to come back and meet uh, my captors. Uh, he wanted me to meet the fighter pilots that I had fought against in, in, in dog fights in the war. He wanted me to meet the camp commander, the enemy who was in charge of all of my torture. And, um, and I told him, no, thank you. I, you know, I had that experience and didn't want to do it again. <laughs> so uh, this went on for three, two or three years. He pestered me for doing this. And, 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 and finally he offered to uh, bring my, my family for a vacation of Vietnam that, that we'd come over and um, and to and, and tour uh, North and South Vietnam. And so I said, yes. And that's what happened. Uh, I took my wife and three of our four kids uh, over there. This has been before they had children. It's been, I guess, uh, maybe six or seven years ago. <clears throat> and we toured um, Vietnam. And, and I did, in fact, get to meet my, my captors, the, the, um, the guy we called the camp commander, we called him the rat. He was a rat. <laughs> he even looked like a rat. <laughs> and well, we had names, you know, for all of our guards and, and whatnot, because we never really knew their real names. But they, but, uh, but I went and, uh, I, I, and, and I, I, I was led to believe that he was in his late eighties, maybe near the end of his runway and that um, he might want to apologize. Uh, nothing could have been farther from the truth. He didn't want to apologize. <laughs> in fact, I uh, went out to this guy's house and the first thing he wanted to do was hug me. 
uh, and <laughs> I, I, I was surprised and taken aback. And so um, he stood back and the guy said to me, he said, uh, I, I was proud to be your warden from 1968 to 1972. And my finest achievement was keeping you and your buddies happy and healthy while you were here. <laughs> and I was like, wait a minute, Bubba, it, it's me. You don't recognize me. <laughs> <laughs> but it was an interesting conversation. He, uh, he, wanted, he, he offered me uh, his, uh, his, his beer. He wanted me to drink his, uh, his homemade beer. Uh, and 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 it was pretty good actually, <laughs> um, but we talked for forty five minutes or an hour, and he would never admit that any of the American prisoners of war had been harmed at all, and that that we he he told me that we had better food and better medical care uh, than the civilians uh, that lived around that prison camp. So. Uh, and they got together with the fighter pilots that I fought against. We we laid out a, a, an aviation chart on a table and uh, you know tried to figure out who was here and who was there and who got the best of whom and uh, you know and through fighter pilot lingo we told lies to each other. <laughs> so, but it was all good. I find that so extraordinary, Captain, and the the like. Have, have you been able to forgive this man? Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> it didn't take very long. See, I taught, I, 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 I was taught uh, discipline from my father early on. He was a, you know, World War II era guy. And I taught a lot of forgiveness from my mother. And my mother was absolutely a saint. Uh, you know, as long as I lived and knew her, before she died, I never ever heard her say a bad word about anybody. Imagine that, you know, somebody who never has any, any anything bad to say, and she didn't. Um, and uh, and she, you know, she used to tell me um, in, in every situation in life, there's there's good news and there's bad news, and this key to life is to find the good news. You know, just make it a puzzle. You know. I, who can find the good news of life? And so, it, you know, and that was one of the first things that came to me in the prison camp was, wait a minute, mom, <laughs> there's gonna be some good news here. But what happened was, uh, I, I, I mean, I was, I was really angry when I was shot down, angry at everything um, and blaming everybody else for the problems and feeling sorry for myself. That went on for about three months. And I, uh, I, I began to communicate with the guys in the other prison cells. And now we were, for, we were forbidden communicating uh, with any of the other prisoners. And, um, and a guy passed a, a note on the end of a wire into my cell and the note had a code where different letters of the alphabet would be represented by two different numbers. A number of the line and then the number of the row. And, uh, and so we started to communicate. We did by tugging on wires or tapping on walls. We got very creative with the communication. And, and so a lot of the communication was just passing around Bible verses and patriotic quotes. And, and one of the quotes that really made a lot of sense to me was, acid does more harm in the vessel it's stored then on the subject, it's poured. What that meant to me was all this acid within me, all this hate and vitriol that I'm spitting out against the enemy um, hurts me more than it hurts the enemy. And so within just the first few months, I decided that mom was right and I had to forgive everybody. And forgive the, the camp commander, forgive the, the guards who were torturing me, forgive the mechanic to put my airplane together, forgive myself, you know, for failing in my mission. And, um, and, and, and so early on, I decided that forgiveness was a quality, not just, just, not just because I'm a Christian and it, 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 it's a thing 
Christians do is to forgive, but for my own self survival, you know, for just, just for my own health, my mental and physical health, it was advantageous for me to get this all out and, and forgive these folks. And so I have, I have no animosity. In, in fact, I used to tell my kids early on, and they would ask me, hey, what if one of those guards walked in the house right now? What if a camp commander came and knocked on, on our door? What would you do? Yeah, exactly. What, that's what they assumed, that I would punch them out. And, and, and I, I would say to them early on, no, I, you know, I'd, I'd say, hey, come on in, have a cup of tea, you know, let's talk, <laughs> talk about the good old days. <laughs> and, and they, and they, I, and my kids didn't believe me. And so they watched me in Vietnam, you know, they watched me interact w w with these, these people and, um, and found out for sure, yeah, oh, no, I'd, I'd forgiven these guys long ago, not because they'd done anything good but just for my own self-preservation, I forgave them. I'm in awe, Captain, of this, this amazing ability. It's something that I've worked so hard on and I'm, I'm a deeply, deeply flawed individual. And, uh, and that's the only time I really speak poorly of myself. And I, I don't mean it in a negative context. I mean it as in like we are all flawed, but I would love to know some techniques that you're able to use to be able to let go and forgive some people that in my life that I know that I hold resentment towards. Well, I appreciate that. And you're right, we're all flawed. And uh, you know, when I, I have a long, long list of flaws, <laughs> ask my wife. <laughs> no, that's not fair. That's not fair. She, <laughs> she's very kind. <laughs> but uh, um, you know, a, a couple of things that I do, I, I talk to myself a lot and I, uh, you know, I, I try to remember the things that I tell other people, you know, because if I'm going to be honest and I, and I really am a, a very honest and, and open, transparent kind of a guy. And if in fact, I'm, if I'm going to tell you that I have forgiven everybody, then to be honest, I have to, uh, you know, I, I, I have to, to act the way I speak. Um, so, but I think the main thing is just to give, convince yourself and believe. And if you don't believe, just say it over and over and over to yourself that in forgiving other people, you know, for, um, for, for whatever they did to you, you're actually freeing yourself. Because forgiveness can be its own little prison or, or lack of same. And, uh, you know, if you, as I said, from the beginning, you point your fingers at other people and they suddenly have, you know, they control your mind. They're in there scurrying around, you know, uh, deciding what you should be thinking. And if you're going to be true to yourself, if you're going to be your own person, if you are in fact going to be <clears throat> captain of, uh, uh, of your soul, as, uh, as the poem says, <laughs> um, you, um, you, you, you have to forgive. You have to let that stuff go. Now, it's not easy to do. And um, it was probably easier for me in that prison camp because I, you know, I, I was hurting. And uh, I, I think that things become clear sometimes when you're hurting physically and mentally. And um, well, well, here's an interesting thing you, you might be, you, you, your, your listeners might be interested in. Um, a study was done a few years ago about all the combatants in Vietnam. 30.6% of everybody exposed to that war has PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Of the prisoners of war, 4% of us have PTSD. And, and the 4% are primarily the guys who were shot down near the end of the war, were not tortured, and were only prisoners for a few weeks or a month or two. Now, what the psychiatrists and psychologists and the people that know a whole lot more about this than I do believe that it takes a certain amount of time and, and a certain amount of pain over that period of time to change your mind about anything. And so the guys who were shot down near the end of the war and have the mental problems just didn't have enough time to, 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 
to assess all of this, and uh, and um, they they weren't able to to figure it all out like the guys that had a lot more time. And and so the reason I thought of that was, you know, um, it it was probably easy for me easier for me to prove forgiveness than it would be to somebody who's not going through that kind of pain for that kind of time. One of the things I found so interesting was the amount of time that you had to yourself. And in in the modern world, they talk about mindfulness. And it sounds like all the POWs had crazy amounts of mindfulness time to be able to self-reflect. Do you think that was a contributing factor in your healing? Absolutely. No, no question. You know, when you consider all of the inputs that you and I have in, 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 in the average day, the sights, the sounds, the smells, the colors, the things we read, the things, the people that we communicate with. I mean, we must, there must be hundreds of thousands of bits of information every day. In a prison cell, when you were alone in solitary confinement, some guys were in solitary for as long as three, as, as four years, all by themselves. The, you know, the biggest outside uh, thing that could happen to you might be a, you hear a bird, you know, singing or an airplane fly over uh, and, and, and that's it. And every other thing in your mind has to be from inside. It, it has to be generated in your mind uh, because it doesn't come from outside. Now, what that does, first of all, it gets very boring <laughs> at first. You just, you know, you, you, you just don't know how to, I mean, we, see, most of the POWs were fighter pilots like me, okay? The, the life of a fighter pilot, man, is absolutely helter-skelter. I mean, it's just everything going on all at the same time. And so, you know, you, you learn to take all these inputs and, and figure out how, how to work them all out. Because... In, in the life of a, of a fighter pilot, you don't have you don't have an extra fifteen seconds a day because something is going on all the time. Suddenly, when you're in a solitary confinement prison cell, and all those inputs are gone, you have to start making up inputs on your own. And so, um, yeah, it, it, it's a, in fact one of the things that I did was I decided to go back through my life and tried to remember every, every book I'd ever read, every movie I'd, I'd ever seen, every teacher I'd ever had, and every girl I'd ever dated. That was the fun part. <laughs> how, long, how long do you think it took a 24-year-old guy to completely remember everything in his mind? Three months. Wow. Three months working for eight or 10 or 12 hours a day for three months to put this this story of my life, this biography, the autobiography, if you will, of my life in, in my mind. And the interesting thing was after that first three months and I thought I had it all, I would, I would suddenly remember something that I hadn't remembered in that first three months. And it was like all day I could spend on that one memory, you know, trying to remember the colors and and the, and the words and the, and and the sounds and smells and, and sights of that one memory, and I could spend a day just doing that. So, so that that's pretty much what we did uh, was uh, make up things in our mind, and and after the first three months of retrospect, then I planned forward. I. I figured I would plan the next 20 years of my life around my wife, the, the lady I had married under the Arch of Swords. And so I went day by day, okay, for 20 years and, and planned out, you know, where we'd go, what duty stations I'd have, what airplanes I would fly, the kids we would have and what in their schools and all this stuff. And we just put these things together. Um, and, and so after, I, I don't remember what that, that took another several months and I hadn't, I wasn't home. <laughs> so I just said, okay, I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna plan it a different way. Um, 
maybe this time I'll get out of the Navy and I'll start a civilian career and I'll it, it, and work it that way. And so uh, it was it was all a matter of uh, keeping your mind active by all of the internal thoughts, you know, that would that would go through my mind. My mind is thinking of those though that goal setting that planning as you are describing it and the, the what came to me captain was my childhood i was a child of divorce and there was quite a lot of dysfunction in the family and for a long time i really couldn't remember what had happened from zero till about 18. there was memories here and there and and i quite, quite often would have friends talk to me about incidents that had happened and i'd be like just look at them like it was blank since i've got my health in order and my mindset has changed, my memories have started to come flooding back. And I feel like that's also part of the healing process. Does that sound like what happened to you? No, I, th I think you're absolutely right. Uh, and it's amazing what's in your mind that you don't, that, that you don't really access. Um, we, we began teaching each other uh, courses that we'd had in uh, in high school and college, and, and in fact, some of the guys had masters and PhDs, uh, and they and they would teach us courses. And in fact, when we came back, some of the universities uh, in in the United States gave us credit for the courses that other POWs had taught us by tapping on the walls and tugging on wires in this crazy code, um, and. Um, <laughs> It, it, you know, without a professor or a book or a PowerPoint or uh, or anything, we, we we got credit for some of the courses because it, it was pretty intense. But but to the point, but your point of what's in your mind, um, Joe Milligan uh, uh, was teaching a course on uh, biology. I'd never taken biology in high school or or college, and and I was quite interested in biology, and uh, so. When when I was first shot down, and maybe the I don't know first several months, I got in contact with this guy Joe Milligan, and uh, his whole course in biology was um, about five days long. That's all they could remember. But every day, Joe would lay back on his board bed and think about biology. And five years later, I took the same course for the guy, and it was six months long. It was everything from protozoas to metazoas to every, everything in biology. He had he had just he he would just comb his mind for specific things that he could recall, and so you know it proves to me that boy, there's an an awful lot in our mind that we never access. But um, but I believe you're right. You know I think once we get our life in order, you get your health back. And your your mind starts working together, and you spend some time thinking about it. See, you know, I look back on the nearly six years I was in a prison camp, and I think one of the, you know, one of the great advantages was I had time. How many how many of us spend five minutes a day, you know, just sitting down and thinking about things? We're always so busy that unless you're into meditation or yoga or something like that. You never even slow down. And so, you know, I think you're right. I think you're accessing things in your mind, uh, you know, just because you're, you know, you're, you're at a better place now than you were. One of the areas of interest, Captain, is health and well-being and nutrition in particular. And, and out of necessity, listeners who have been on previous podcasts will know that I've adopted this animal protein only diet, <clears throat> excuse me, to sort my autoimmune issues out. And it's been life-changing. And one of the quotes that you that you mentioned uh, in your interview with Jocko Willinick was that in fairness, they gave us enough food to keep us alive. And what they fed you was like, in terms of modern cuisine was virtually nothing. And we could go into that in a minute, but before too long, you would have been in a, a deep ketogenic state. You would have been roasting your own body fat as fuel. And, and that was largely the reason why you lost so much weight from what you were talking about, from what you went into when you came out. 
And I'm not sure whether that biology lesson that you were being taught in, in jail or prison uh, spoke about ketone bodies and how they are the most efficient fuel source for the body and the gamma hydroxybutyrate that they produce and, uh, and the efficiency of the brain that happens when you are on a keto diet. So you're effectively on this keto diet for the whole time that you're incarcerated, which I find so interesting in, in the sharpness in which you describe the memories that you're able to recall. I wonder if that had a, a major contributing factor to it. Uh, well, I certainly never thought about it like that. And um, I, I don't want, I don't know much about keto diets and, uh, but I'd like to learn more about it. And, but I think you're right. Um, first of all, you know, we had very little sugar um, and, uh, and, and very little processed food at, at all. You know, our diet was primarily uh, unpolished rice, uh, which has a, a lot of nutrition in unpolished rice. Um, and that was usually served with a, uh, a bowl of broth of some kind. And um, you could tell that there had been some animal fat in the broth because uh, about once a month, you'd find in your bowl of broth uh, a piece of uh, pork belly. And uh, not too many of your listeners will know what pork belly is. So I'll tell you, <laughs> unless they're a farmer, uh, <laughs> but pork belly is, uh, is a little triangle from the belly of a, of a pig. And in the triangle, the top of the triangle might be a little bit of piece of lean meat, maybe, uh, but probably not. And then of course you have all the fat and then you have the skin and then you have all the hair. <laughs> well, of course, I mean, what any, you know, any, any normal thinking person would do would, uh, you know, fish that out and, and take your spoon and go whop, you know, throw that thing against the wall. <laughs> And then about, uh, you know, two or three weeks went by and you think, well, me, you know, I don't know, maybe I need that, uh, that protein and you, you know, carve off a little bitty piece of, uh, show, of, of protein off the apex of that triangle and all the rest of it, you go, whop. <laughs> and then about two or three weeks later, you're eating the whole thing, hair and all, and be very thankful <laughs> that you had <laughs> something besides rice. <laughs> but um, no, I, I'll have to think of that because I, I did come back in, in, in very good health and of course, mentally and physically. Um, you know, we, we, we have, a, we have a, a, a mental and physical exam every year. The POWs uh, go down to Pensacola, Florida and they, they set up a control group when we first came home, of fighter pilots, you know, basically same age, weight, background. Uh, fighter pilots who weren't shot down and captured. That's the control group. And then they have us, the guys who went through that. And they find that they've got two or three times as many problems, mental and physical, in the control group than they have with the XPOWs. And so, you know, I, I, again, uh, to me, that, that has a lot to do with mindset and your, and your control. But I think you might be right that diet might have might also play a very important part of that. Well, what, you, what you've described, Captain, is uh, extended fasting or intermittent fasting. You might have heard the phrase used. And mm -hmm. when you when you are fasting for periods longer than usually about 72 hours, your body releases uh, the, the growth hormones, testosterone rises in men. You know, and because you're in a deep ketogenic state, those those ketone bodies are being pumped through your bloodstream and they are the most efficient fuel source. And what they think that the problem is with a lot of modern uh, chronic disease and illness is that we're not eating a the food that we've, you know, evolved to eat. Uh, but we've also got in all those, you know, the sugars and the the industrial seed oils and a lot of this and a lot of the other guests that I interview are experts in this field and I'd be more than happy to connect you with them. Uh, were you ever allowed outside? Did you ever see any sunlight in the time that you were incarcerated? Not in the first five years I was there. <clears throat> uh, we were in jail cells and, and that's pretty much what it was. And we were totally, um, totally isolated. Um, near the end of the war, uh, a few months before I was released, they let 
they let us outside. And, um, and, and that was kind of a, a dilemma as well, because we, we knew, or at least we assumed, that the reason they were doing that was try to put some color in our face, because as you can, as you can imagine, when you're inside without any sunlight for all that time, you get, you, uh, you get kind of peaked, and, uh, and they didn't want to send us home uh, looking ill at all. And so they allowed us outside and they started giving us better food to, uh, to pump up our body. And uh, so the dilemma of course was that our senior officers thought, well, maybe this is not a good idea, you know, because we're gonna go home look, looking like we've been on vacation here, we've been on, in some resort and, uh, and, 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 and it was gonna be tough to tell people, you know, that we were eating rice and, and being tortured. So, um, but then I think they came to their senses and we ate all that stuff and enjoyed ourselves outside <laughs> anyway. But um, yeah, m yeah, most of the time uh, I was there, I spent inside, inside that prison cell. Oh, it's just so hard for me to comprehend and, and uh... I'm, I'm really trying to take myself there and it's just, it's, it's, it's a real challenge. I'm not going to lie. Uh, and I'm sure people listening to this or watching this will be experiencing the same, you know, going to jail, uh, is one of my, one of my phobias. <laughs> I don't have many, I'm not fearful of many things, but going to pray, prison and being assaulted in prison is one of my fears. I don't know why. I think maybe just from watching too much television, uh, captain, I had a question the the tv series hogan's heroes was a huge popular show certainly in new zealand and australia where i grew up and i know uh all through north america as well how remotely different were those shows to reality of what you experienced yeah hogan's heroes was not at all re uh, real and i enjoyed that too you know uh, as a kid i <clears throat> uh it was a funny funny show um and, uh, and 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 all the cleverness, you know, of the of the prisoners. But now there was nothing that, you know. First of all, um, we we were we we were never befriended, okay, by um, by any of the enemy. They were very strict and very stern, and so there was no, uh, it was never a smile for me. Those guys. I, uh, I, I I've forgotten the the the, the German uh, um, guard's name, but you know the guy who was always the the, the big guy he was kind of um, he, Sergeant he Schultz. Kind of stupid. Schultz, yeah, sure, Sergeant Schultz. Hogan. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember that now. But no, we never had anybody like that. Uh, the second part of it was we, you know, as I say, we never got outside. You know, we didn't have volleyball games or out playing uh, baseball or anything. It wasn't, it, it, the Hogan's Heroes was based on World War II uh, compounds. And that's the way they held prisoners in Germany um, and, and even in Japan in World War II were the big compounds with the big wire fences. And, uh, and, and yes, you had a place to sleep in kind of a bunk room, but oh, by the way, you were out, outside all the time. and and conversing with the other prisoners. Now, interestingly enough, I went through four different schools to teach me to be a prisoner of war. They were called SERE, S-E-R-E, -E, Survival, uh, Escape, Resistance, and Evasion. Um, and, and, and all four of those schools were like World War II prison camps. And, um, and so when I got to the prison camp, I assumed that I'd be let outside and, you know, I'd be introduced to Schultz and the boys, <laughs> and, and 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 of course it never happened. Now, when, since we came home, we have uh, revised all those schools, and um, um, because they just really weren't very realistic at all, um, to, in in our mind, and did not prepare us well at all for going into that situation. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, no, the the, the resemblance of my uh, experience at Hogan's Heroes is very remote. I feel terrible even um, putting them in the same room as each other. It's just, it's the closest <laughs> thing I've got to compare to anything. I have no other reference apart from a few other movies. Um, Top Gun 2, 
comes out released worldwide uh, i think on july 1st of 2021 and i'm very happy to 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 realize that you are directly responsible for top gun school and the reason that those first that first movie exists in the first place well it was an interesting time uh in history um what, what was actually happening was we our, we were trained and our airplanes were built for the Cold War, all right? The airplane that I flew, the F-4 Phantom, was designed from the keel up to launch from the aircraft carriers, fly up to 60 or 70 or 80,000 feet, shoot our missiles from 20 or 30 miles away, uh, make a slow turn and return and land on the aircraft carrier. That was our mission. I trained in a spacesuit, an uh, astronaut spacesuit, you know, the bubble canopy and carried my, my air conditioner around in a briefcase. Um, that's the way I trained because that was the war we were supposed to be fighting. And that was the, the war that the, tra- that, that the airplane had been developed to fight. So we got over to Vietnam and found out that we weren't fighting the high altitude Russian bombers anymore. We we're fighting these pex- pesky little MiG airplanes that were lighter and faster could turn inside us and so we and and we hadn't been trained to dogfight at all because in the cold war you don't get into a dogfight you shoot them from 20 or 30 miles away and you don't even see your enemy Uh, that that was what i was uh trained to do that 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 was what was going on so i um i showed up uh at miramar naval air station in san diego with my buddy Paul Krukey, and we were both 23 at the time. And uh, we found that we had a six month wait to, uh, to learn to fly this high altitude supersonic interceptor. Now we were, we felt very fortunate to have been selected because at the time it was the hottest airplane in the world. I mean, it, it had the, the speed and the time to climb. This is a Mach 2 airplane. This is over 1400 miles an hour. And uh, so we felt very, very happy to be doing that. And then we found out we got a six month wait before we can get into the controls of this jet. So Kruki and I uh, walked down the flight line and, and, and it's a big, it's a, it's a big base at Miramar. And down at the end of the flight line was another school teaching pilots um, to fly in instrument conditions. And, uh, and it, it, this is a deal where uh, the students in the back seat with, uh, with, with all of the, the, the windows covered, okay? He's, he's totally in a, in, in a bag so that he can't see anything outside and it simulates being in the soup, you know, in the clouds. And so the student learns to fly the airplane on instruments and, and gets a qualification, instrument, instrument qualification. So uh, just to just so we could keep flying airplanes, Paul and I signed on to, uh, to fly uh, certain hops, for certain flights with this instrument training squadron. So we'd take the students out and we were in the front seat, you know, we could see everything going on, the students in the back seat under the bag. And, uh, and at the end of the, uh, of the flight, we'd save a few hundred pounds of jet fuel and we would lurk lurk off the coast of San Diego, waiting for the F-4 Phantoms, you know, the hot shots coming off the runway. And they'd get out, you know, 15, 20 miles out over the ocean and we would pounce on these guys. Well, again, we were lighter. We were, uh, we could turn inside these guys and we would wipe these guys out every time. The, 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 fl- the plane we were flying, an F-9 Cougar, was a Korean War airplane, for goodness sakes. and. Uh, it, and it was not supersonic, uh, but we could turn inside them and uh, we were lighter than they were. And so we would win in all these engagements. And we were, so Paul and I did this for, I don't know, a month, I guess. And one day we came back to the ready room and on the bulletin board, <laughs> the ready room, I'll never forget it, the big yellow poster, Plum and Krukey report to the commanding officer of the F-4 squadron immediately. So here are these uh, two wet behind the ears and sweaty guys in sweaty flight suits because we just come come back, you know, from this dogfight, and, uh, and and we're knocking on the door uh, to the commanding officer of this F-4 squadron. 
And he says, come in. And, and we open the door and he, here sets this guy behind a big oak desk, okay? And he's looking over uh, top of his glasses. He's got readers on, he's looking over the top and he's an old guy, you know, like 35 or so. <laughs> And, and, and he looks at us over the top of his guy. You the two guys out there in the F-9s fighting with the F-4s? We, we get, incidentally, this, this was really verboten. This was really against the rules for us to just attack these guys without telling them. And so we said, uh, uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. We're the guys. Uh, and, and, and the commanding officer said, did you follow an F-4 through an entire loop? And did you have your guns trained on that F-4 the entire time? Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, sir, we did. He said, I was in that F-4. <laughs> we thought we were toast. We thought he'd pull our wings. And then he said, I just came back from Vietnam. You guys looked an awful lot like MiGs back there. And we need to train my pilots to fight the MiGs. You want to go out and do it again tomorrow? <laughs> For the next five months, Paul Krukey and I had the greatest job in the Navy. You know, we had our Snoopy goggles and our white scarves and we'd go out there <laughs> being the enemy and we would fight the F-4s and teach them to dogfight with, with, this, with, with this airplane, which is designed totally for Cold War uh, interactions. And, and, and so that started a syllabus within that replacement air group, which later became Navy Fighter Weapon School, Top Gun, um, and, and and so that's that that's how, that all be, began and almost accidentally. Um, but what happened? Oh, what the, what the commanding officer said to us, he said, "You know, I just got back from Vietnam. We're getting slaughtered over there. Our kill ratio is terrible because we don't know how to fight these little pesky MIGs." Well, and and through Top Gun, um, the see that would have been in 1966. And by about 1968 or nine, we had turned that ratio totally around. The kill ratio now was in our favor because we finally figured out how to fight these little pesky MiGs. And that's how Top Gun got started. That's so cool. Uh, and I'm gonna watch that movie with a newfound respect. <laughs> I was pretty young when the first one came out, Captain, and, uh, and I'm, I'm really looking forward. I don't know if you've had a chance to see the, uh, the preview for it yet i've i've seen the i've seen the trailer for top gun 2 and it really looks fun um but you know uh my, my my call sign in vietnam was plumber you know i could have been maverick or goose or something but plumber <laughs> <laughs> maybe we could go through your book and uh and change it to something that you uh that yeah, you think yeah, is pl plumber's pretty good, good. Plum is pretty good. <laughs> Captain, you are a phenomenal speaker and, and a Hall of Fame speaker and part of the Speaker Roundtable and, and uh, the wonderful Patricia Fripp, who I had the honour of interviewing earlier this year, said that I must ask you about your first testimonial speech. <laughs> uh, yeah, Fripp. Trip loves that speech. In fact, anytime we're together in a group, she makes me tell that story. <laughs> but um, but uh, when we finally got together in larger groups in their prison camp, um, and, and, and this was a result primarily of a raid that, um, that the United States Army had made on one of the outlying prison camps. While I was there, I was in a total of six different camps and they moved me in and out of those camps about every six months. And so uh, there was a main downtown, the one we called the Hanoi Hilton. But then there were, there were probably more than six because uh, I wasn't in all of them. And, and so there was probably another eight or 10 little camps outside. And they, try, they, they did this, we thought, to try to keep us separated and try to keep us from fraternizing with any of the guards, that kind of thing, and just to try to upset us all the time, they were moving us around. Well, um, the uh, Army, U.S. Army Green Berets made a raid on one of these camps, it was called Sante. Um, they came up empty-handed because 
the enemy had moved the prisoners out of Sante and into another camp. But what what happened with that was it's, it, it, it frightened the North Vietnamese so terribly that they brought us all into the Hanoi Hilton. Well, the camp wasn't big enough to hold 500 prisoners. So they had to put us into um, larger groups. And I found myself in a, in a room of 57 guys and the room was 20 feet wide and 30 feet long. I remember we each had 14 inches of bed space, <laughs> uh, but we were together uh, at, at last, you know, for the first time we were in a large group. And so um, it made it a whole lot easier in teaching each other courses and we played games with each other and, and, and had a religious service and that kind of thing. And, and you know, it, it really was phenomenal um, just to be together for the first time. And so, but, but as a result uh, of all of this, um, we, we were able to, um, to you know, connect the dots and figure out who'd been where and, and who'd been uh, what. And, and of course we were fighter pilots. And so we told them, uh, you know, a lot of stories with each other. <clears throat> and it was, a, it was a great advantage just, just being together. Um, but again, you know, we, we were all so similar in nature. We'd all, we either Navy or Air Force or, or Marine Corps, uh, and, uh, and, and and we'd all been through flight training, so we knew the aviation lingo and and, and all of that. And, uh, and and just to be with the other guys, it was it was great. But one of the things, of course, was then we didn't have any alone time. Suddenly things started to pick up and we were you know, busy with uh, teaching courses and, uh, and, and, and playing games and you know, telling movies and books that we had seen. That was our entertainment at night. We would, um, what, you know, one guy would, would sit there and, and we would all listen to a, a movie that he had seen. I'll never forget, Dr. Zhivago was, um, was one of the big movies at the time. And, um, and one, one of the guys, who had thought about it a lot would tell the whole thing. And, uh, and it would maybe take about an hour to tell the story. Um, and, and, and then, you know, several years later, he's telling the same story. And then it's now it's five hours long. And the rating had gone from PG to X. <laughs> so. <clears throat> I'd love to ask you a question, Captain. Uh, it might be a curly one for you. I'm, one of the one of the thoughts that comes into my mind is that time, the time periods alone, with no, you know, if presumably the majority of the men were straight and had wives at home or girlfriends or. How how did you cope with that the 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 need to release sexual energy, and if if. Yeah, I'll ask you that, and then I'll ask a follow-up question. Sure. Well, uh, just to be quite honest, we, we were we were we were young, virile guys, you know, and uh, and there was uh, there was a lot of pent-up sexual energy, and so there was a lot of nocturnal emissions. <laughs> in fact, it became kind of a joke, you know. We were always in competition with each other, and uh, and 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 you know how many sit-ups can you, how many push-ups, you know. Um, competitions with each other and we would tap on the walls and to the guys next door and say uh what's your record for your wet dreams and um and the guys had had the record for a long time had four wet dreams in one night and then it was discovered that the fourth one was after he woke up <laughs> just just a little prison humor there <laughs> It, I, I find this so interesting, and I know a lot of people wouldn't dare ask this, but there's a there's a large upswell of people in this no fap community, and I don't know if you know what I mean by no fap, Captain. Uh, it, it's it's abstaining from self gratification or masturbation, for lack of a better word, right? And and it's all okay. about keeping your energy within you, and they think that using pornography is really destructive to your subconscious and uh, giving away your your energy. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I've never even heard of that, but um, 
I, uh, I, I don't think I would agree necessarily with that. I'm not sure that, um, you know, that, that it's, it's kind of a different kind of energy uh, as far as I can see. Um, but then I've, I don't know, I, I, I would, I guess I would just have to, uh, to go with what the experts say on that, because I, I'm not sure I, I could be very much help. Oh, you know what? I forgot to tell you about, you, you asked me about Frippy and I got to talking about something else, <clears throat> but Patricia Fripp likes this story. And it's when we, uh, when we finally got together in bigger groups, we formed what we call the to Toastmasters Club. We had guys who had been in Toastmasters and knew um, the progression of, uh, of speeches. And so um, in, in Toastmasters, when you're, you, you, the first time you're there, they ask you to make what they call the icebreaker speech. And so you get up and you talk about your life. And then it, it, and then it goes to other, other specific things. Like I know one of the speeches called the eyes have it. How much eye contact do you have with your audience? And, and then one's called the hands up, how, your gestures and expressions. But, but the first speech was, um, was called um, the icebreaker. And that's to tell everybody a little bit about your life. And so uh, in this group of 57 guys I was telling you about, we had um, a Toastmasters club. And so there I was, I was gonna give my icebreaker. And I decided to make it a little bit different from everybody else who says, well, you know, I was born in, in, in Indiana and grew up in Kansas and this is what I did. And I, I decided to make a little story out of it. And so my icebreaker speech was something like this. Uh, the setting is heaven. The date is the 19th of May of 1967. The characters are St. Peter and God. God stands at his, uh, his desk and he, he lowers the gavel and he says, next case. St. Peter opens the ledger. And now this is the speech that I'm making. St. Peter opens the letter, letter and he reads, well, the next, uh, the next person is Charles Plum, but God, we got to be quickly uh, on this because we got to make this decision. He's in a heap of trouble. He's in his F4 Phantom and um, he, um, he, he, he is uh, uh, about to eject because he'd been hit by a surface to air missile. And so God asks him to describe this kid that's in trouble in this airplane. Well, he grew up in Kansas and he used to tease his sister and then he went to the Naval Academy and married his high school sweet. He goes through the, the, the whole litany. And, and so finally, St. Peter says, he says, that God, we got to decide on this. You know, that it, it's really important. This is a life or death issue. And God finally brings the gavel down and says, okay, open the parachute. <laughs> and that was... That was my icebreaker. That, that, that was my first speech. <laughs> was that your first standing ovation? Uh, no, but I had a captive audience. <laughs> <laughs> Captain, I'd, I'd love for you to share one more story before I, uh, before I allow you to go and live your life. And it's the, and it's the seaman that fell off the, the boat and that was rescued but had an extraordinary memory and what he did with that, that memory later on absolutely i'm always happy to tell this story because again it, it um it brings to mind the people in your life that you don't really expect anything from uh and yet they they, they rise to the occasion and um and are a great benefit to, to everybody Seaman Douglas Hegdall was 19 years old um, when he fell off his ship. Now, in the prison camp, we were all fighter pilots, so we were all educated. You know, we had bachelors and masters and PhDs. Uh, we were all uh, lifers. Pretty, I mean, pretty much, we were very dedicated to have a career in the military, um, you know, for the most part. And who shows up? The Navy sailor. Well, how did a sailor get into a prison camp in an air war 
over over North Vietnam. Well, he he he, he fell off his ship. And, and in fact, he would he would tell us, "I wasn't captured like you pilots. I was rescued." <laughs> <laughs> so, Hegdal, um, in the middle of the night, fell off the cruiser Canberra, and, uh, and and joined us in a prison camp. And uh, so he started tapping on walls and tugging on wires and communicating with everybody else. Well, one of the things we did was come up with just a little silly little game, a uh, little questionnaire. Okay, who's the oldest in the prison camp? We play that for a while. Who's got the most kids back home? We play that for a while. Who's been here the longest? One time we had what we call the high fast, low slow contest to try to deter determine what fighter pilot had jumped out of his jet going highest and fastest and who jumped out going lowest and slowest. Well, high fast contest was won by some Air Force pilot who, uh, who jumped out of his F-105 fighter at 52,000 feet. And the low slow contest was won by the Navy sailor, 12 feet at 15 knots. <laughs> well, but the story in the interesting part is this. He decided that he was not being put upon. He was not on the defensive in that prison camp, but he still had a war to fight and he was gonna do whatever he could to be valuable to the rest of the group. So he started memorizing names. Uh, 254 of us in that particular prison camp, he, he memorized 254 names. He put these names in, into songs. He would sing these songs over and over until he got them all, but he wasn't nearly finished. Went back through his list, he memorized our social security number or identifier, 254 different long numbers. Still wasn't finished. Went back through the list, he memorized our hometowns all, all across the country. He memorized our next of kin, wives and fathers. And finally, I'm not kidding, he memorized the telephone numbers of each of the relatives of each of the prisoners. That took two years. About that time, largely because our wives were back here petitioning our government and governments around the world to stop torturing their husbands, um, the torture ended. And the Vietnamese decided that they're going to prove their lenient and humane treatment by sending a couple of, of the prisoners home before the end of the war. So our senior man sent the message to the sailor, son, I want you to volunteer to go home first. The sailor sent back, sir, with all due respect, I would rather stay here with the team. I wanna march home with you guys. Our senior man said, that's not an option. Here's a direct order, shove off. The sailor said, aye, aye, sir. And home he came. Now write the script on this sailor, two years in prison by accident. He's been starved, humiliated, lonely, tortured, but things are looking up. He suddenly has a brand new suit of clothes on, two years back pay in his pocket, and he's free on the streets of San Diego. But he decided that he would spend the next several months of his life, his own money, his own time, going from west coast to east, north to south. He went through each one of the hometowns he memorized. He dialed each one of those telephone numbers he memorized. He spoke to each one of the wives he memorized, told her that her prisoner was alive. So we have these, um, we have these reunions, the POWs, and we've done pretty well, as I've mentioned to you before. Of the 591 men who came home, we've produced 17 generals and seven admirals in the military. Most of us retired as senior grade military officers. We went back to flying airplanes and commanding fleets around the world. And they're telling us today we're healthier mentally and physically than the guys who, uh, who didn't get shot down. So we have these reunions and in come the admirals and then we, we produced two United States senators, a vice presidential candidate, a presidential candidate, uh, two ambassadors from our number. And so all these big dignitaries march in and who gets to say an ovation? The sailor that memorized the names and came home and showed us all a little bit about leadership. I love that story, Captain, and I'm so grateful that you shared that. And one of the ambassadors that you were talking about went to become an ambassador for the United States 
in Vietnam, if I'm not mistaken. That's very true. <clears throat> yep. Um, ambassador Peterson uh, was uh, ambassador for, uh, the in fact, the first ambassador to the North Vietnam, Vietnam and he married a Vietnamese lady. So <clears throat> it's interesting the way these things turn out. I've got to ask this question before we, before we wrap this up, Captain. What is a technique, if you have one, that our listeners I can use that will replicate or assimilate or get close to the mindfulness that you were able to practice during your time as a POW? I, I think the main thing that we all have to believe is that we still have control, that we can't change the things around us, but we can change our response to the things around us. And that's, and that's a wonderful feeling of confidence when you, when you, re, when you know that you have that much control of your life. And, and so, it's, so I think it begins with that knowledge that, hey, I'm the master of my fate. I'm the captain of my soul. And, and, and if you can really believe that within yourself, then all the challenges you face become easier because you're, you're suddenly not the brute uh, of, 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 of somebody else's anger. You're, you know, you, you're, 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 you're not um, being put upon. You're not on the defensive anymore. You're on the offensive because you're making the decisions. And I think if you can, if you can really remember that and tell that to yourself and believe it, um, you can overcome about any problem in life. Do you have any concluding thoughts before we wrap this up, Captain? Well, it's awfully good to be with you and uh, and with your your uh, viewers and listeners. I I really appreciate who you are and what you've done and and uh, and and I'm sure that you can relate to a lot of the things that I've been through because you've been through a lot of those same kinds of things yourself. And I don't think you know. I, I think there's an awful lot of similarity between my experience and uh, and the experience of uh, you know most every day, and particularly in this pandemic, and we're all locked down, and and uh, you know we we have to we have to continually remind ourselves that hey, you know I'm, I'm I'm still a good person. I still have control of my life, and sometimes with all of the external inputs, it's it's hard to believe, but. Um, I, you know, I am available and transparent. Uh, my uh, my website, charlieplum.com, C-H-A-R-L-I-E-P-L-U-M-B.com. And uh, I answer the emails and uh, I'd be happy to communicate with anybody you'd like to communicate. From the bottom of my heart, Captain, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, Captain Charlie Plum.